We started this project um, about three years ago, approximately at the same time when UNESCO was launching launching its Futures of Education initiative. And um, we realized at that point how two major problems became really visible at the preparation of that UNESCO's Futures of Education report. First problem, and this is one of the foundations of the work, the starting point of some of the works that we do, and maybe Liz, we can go to the next slide. So the um, uh, first um, problem is that education is really very directly implicated in the climate crisis that we are facing right now, and many speakers have already talked about it today. So, um, and I think it's really becomes really clear when we see all of the efforts internationally that are being put to promote education as key to sustainability, yet we really see how schools and universities instead continue to serve and maintain the status quo, including separated, separating humans from nature, including prioritizing workforce supply for economic development over environmental sustainability, including really um, putting a lot of value on individualism and competitiveness uh, rather than collaboration and interdependence among many, many other things. And um, as uh, David Orr said a couple of years ago, more of the same type of education will not help us um, alleviate the, uh, the climate crisis. We need a completely different type of education. So um, so this is one entry point um, into the discussion for us. The other entry point is that a lot of the discussions about the futures of education are happening without the participation of young people. And this became really, really evident in the UNESCO's Futures of Education report that um, convened a steering committee of the most amazing individuals, scholars, former presidents. Actually, it was led by the current president of Ethiopia. Um, this steering committee was chaired by the current president of Ethiopia. But the steering committee did not include any single representative of youth. And we thought it was so ironic but also so telling of our current times that the futures of education are being decided without the people who will be living those very futures. So this um, became the impetus for our project. So we decided to start a project in parallel to the UNESCO's Futures of Education Initiative. And um, we thought that it would be really important to mobilize youth visions of education futures, and then bring those visions in conversation with the larger UNESCO initiative. So we started a parallel project about three years ago, which was called Turn It Around. And um, to you know really bridge these different conversations. And we decided also as part of this process to make art a um, central feature of the project. And this is partially because art is a relationship builder because and because the climate crisis is about our relationship to the planet and to each other. And um, it's one of the ways of how we can be relating to each other because art really inspires dialogue and empathy because it also inspires revolutionary action. And art is one of the most universal languages in the world as some of the speakers also mentioned today. So someone does not need to learn a language for years in order to look at a piece of art and interpret it. And uh, art really evokes very raw um, emotion and it inspires transformation. So what we wanted to do was um, we wanted to crowdsource use visions of education futures through the art. And we wanted to use this art to move policymakers on an affective level because all of the scientific data that they have at their fingertips is not used um, appropriately. So we thought that in addition to all of the important work that's done on the scientific side, that perhaps we can also try to engage art in um moving them on an effective level. So this is how the project was conceived and it was uh, 
developed together with students and um, artists and professors at Arizona State Universities, but then it really spread out globally. So um, we um, invited basically crowdsourced youth visions of education futures, climate futures through social media networks, inviting children and youth to share their artwork and text responses to several prompts, such as asking young people to imagine their, tell us about their ideal learning environments, tell us what they can learn from nature that they cannot learn at school, share their everyday actions that contribute to livable future on earth, tell us why climate education should be included in the curriculum, and also tell policymakers what children and young people want policymakers to know when they make decisions about their futures. And also questions like, where do young people find hope and resilience to face the uncertain futures? So through um, uh, Instagram and TikTok and Twitter, well, it's, while it was still Twitter, and uh, actually also on the ground workshops, we invited people to uh, share their visions and their ideas with us in the form of art, but also text. And so we received in a really short time uh, contributions from over a thousand people from over 60 countries, five continents, and was really fascinating because most of the submissions actually came from the global south um, compared to the global north. And, north. and this is perhaps because this is where the effects of the climate crisis are felt the most. And, um, but so that disproportion actually was really, really interesting. But also what's important is that in this process, we invited people to, anybody could contribute. So it actually mobilized visions and ideas of climate activists that may not be visible in the media on an everyday basis, like Greta Thunberg and others, but people who are climate activists in their everyday lives and who do absolutely powerful work that um, is that needs to be seen and known and engaged with. So this became also a part of the um, mobilization of these visions. So then what we did was we curated all of the artwork that you can find on the website that Liz will share with you. But what kind of the the one of the approaches that we did was we um, curated the um, the submissions in the form of flashcards, and um, because flashcards are one of the most basic teaching tools that adults use to teach basic facts to children and youth, so we thought that we would turn it around and decided to basically ask children and youth what are some of the basic facts that adults in power policymakers should know when they make decisions about the futures. So these uh, flashcards then, actually Liz will talk about it a little bit more, but they became the teaching tool that connected the pedagogical tools that connected young people's visions of climate futures and education role in the climate futures to the policymakers and the conversations in uh, the boardrooms. And we'll talk about it in a couple of minutes. Um, and we also, in addition to these cards, the website and the physical cards that we produced, we actually also wrote a policy report where we analyzed all of the submissions and presented them in a language that perhaps is more familiar to policymakers. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes. But Liz, over to you. Yeah, so from the amazing submissions we received from youth around the world, we were able to have the student researchers on this project identify the key turning points that we need to turn it around to support ecologically just and sustainable futures. These four turning points were a intergenerational turn, a decolonial turn, a methodological turn, and a pedagogical turn. So to go a little deeper into those, first off, an intergenerational turn. Youth are the future holders of the world. It is their futures and they are not included in the conversations of what should be changing with their education and what should be changing to have them have strong ecological literacy. So to turn in this area, youth need to be included in the conversations of making decisions and making decisions around power and policy because it is their futures that are being impacted. 
Next, our deck activates a decolonial turn that by cu cutting across the established hierarchies of Western knowledge and opening up for policy space from multiple perspectives from indigenous and land-based knowledges to non-Western philosophies and eco-activist movements, this recognizes that the interdependence of all beings and there's that includes non-humans and humans as well. We additionally have the methodological turn, which is activated by weaving together the aesthetic and imaginative lenses of art and poetry with ecological, experiential, and empirical knowledges. It invites us to engage differently and fosters a new way of conversation with one another and our changing world. And finally, we have the pedagogical turn, which activates by envisioning a radical transformation of education systems around the principles of interdependence and interconnectedness and make everyone and everything that are part of each Earth's ecological community come together. Um, let, this Liz, is, I think that the yeah. slides aren't turning anymore. Nope, I just realized that. So apologies, please enjoy the quick slideshow. <laughs> As I the realized my slideshow. computer was glitching. Well, back to you, Aveta. All right. Uh, so, so in this project, the the use artwork and written responses send this really strong signal for urgency to dismantle the unjust systems, to reconfigure our relationships with each other and the planet, and to make education paradigm will turn. So we're kind of playing with this idea of turns a lot in, in this particular initiative. And this requires unlearning the deep-seated assumptions about the dominant models of education, which became really visible in the artworks that was submitted and shared with us. So, um, and here we actually work with some of the, you know, the this deep-seated assumptions about education in terms of the root metaphors or kind of, you know, some of the larger metaphors that really uh, shape how we feel, how we um, how we think about education, right, and how we engage uh, in it. And so, just some examples here. So, progress is uh, one of those metaphors that um, is used really widely in education. And uh, so it assumes that social change is linear, that it's always associated with improvement and enrichment for everyone. And you can see how in the youth artwork, and this particular is by um, Ishita Maurya from India, where she portrays progress as a meat grinder, which is operated by a few white men who are putting nature, plants, animals, water bodies, through the meat grinder to make profit and build uh, the Western world. Antonia Herrera from Lampa in Chile sends another chilling reminder. So she says, no matter how much money polluting industries have made, when wildfires consume the last forest, when the last city is flooded, when we are unable to produce any food and are severely dehydrated because of the extremely high heat and no water to drink, money won't save us. So this idea is really um, well portrayed also by this 15 year old artist from New York where she puts the world in a sand clock, right? And basically also showing how we are running out of time. So really, really vivid, um, powerful images that um, cannot be unseen once you see, see these images, right? And they like put in question a lot of the basic assumptions that we have about what is good education, for example, or, you know, what is good life. So the next, um, the next example is uh, the um, arrow of time, which is also really, um, strongly critiqued by the artists in this project. So it's a metaphor that's used to describe a unidirectional movement of time from past to future, which is um, highlights constant progression of events unfolding in abstracted infinite time space continuum. It ignores other temporal temporalities always propelling us towards a single vision of the future. And, um, and some of the artists was who uh, shared the ideas in this report basically they're really challenged again this one 
vision of the temporarily saying that humans are only the only beings on planet who wear a watch. There is no one who can rush flowers nor the rain, right? Or the other one you can see here, nature does not hurry, but gets everything accomplished. So it kind of reframes the thinking about time in different ways as well. Then another root metaphor that very often is used in education is um, that of a machine and uh, basically view, viewing nature, but also schooling um, as a machine, right, based on the industrial revolution um, models. And so here we see this metaphor of machine extended to its logical dead end portraying the human as a machine too, with the smoke stacks coming out of the person's head while they suffocate in gray smoke. So this nature is a machine worldview focuses on reducing nature to its exploitable value to benefit humans in the name of progress and development. And, uh, and the young people who shared their artwork show how ridiculous this approach is right and how harmful it is to both people and nature then uh just that we'll share a couple more examples with you one is the idea of universality that is also critiqued um quite a lot too and here the universality assumes that the western modernist knowledge and ways of knowing such as human exceptionalism or liberal individualism um that that these should not be looked as universal truths that are applicable to all humans across all spaces, right? So the again, applying this idea of universality to its own dead end, you know, some of the young artists to talk about how we too disappear as we engage in this universal pursuit of um, progress and development. Individualism is another metaphor, which is one of the basics of Western cultural identity, and it's based on the assumption that individual and not the group is a primary figure in society. So each human is seen as autonomous and independent individual whose self-interest takes over the collective good. So rather than finding ways to connect and collaborate, individualism urges people to pursue their personal freedoms and their individual gains, which in turn creates competition among people. So, um, and while most Western cultures promote individualism, the US artwork portrays the culture of individualism as a real threat to human and non-human existence. And instead what they talk about is a culture of interdependence, which we will talk a little bit more later as well. So the culture of interdependence and also of um, collaboration and um, the connectedness that we have. Human exceptionalism is another one, um, one of the other metaphors that um, young people critique and really propose to uproot. And uh, it, the, this artwork really exposes the incompatibility of a human exceptionalism logic with sustainability goals. But, and then at the same time, it also demonstrate the destructive consequences of capitalist systems for the human and modern human world. So here we see um, Ramesh Duratkar, also from India, who is reminding us that we are the first generation to know that we are destroying the world and we could be the last one to do anything about it. And uh, Mariana Maldonado from Mexico City is similarly emphasizes um, that humans are also animals offering a collage where humans and animals, knowledge systems and environments are interdependent and interconnected. Liz, over to you. Yeah. So with these metaphors in mind, our team's analysis threaded the perspectives from global youth's art and messages and put a diffractive analysis together where we imagined a range of pedagogical turns to challenge policymakers and educators. And you can see those turns from confronting the nature and human divide and resituating the human within Earth's ecological community and redefining the purpose of education into broader ecological terms. So not just focusing on how do we teach people to make money in our current capitalist and competitive systems, focusing not just on scientific literacy and numeracy, but also looking into ecological literacy as well and not taking the focus away from the human and the student, but having world-centered pedagogies, learning with the world rather than about or apart from it, 
and engaging youth in decision making for their education futures and breaking those generational divides. So to move into how we're activating these turns with the project beyond the deck itself, the project, it encapsulated youth artwork and written responses, and it sends a very strong signal for urgent needs to dismantle the unjust systems and re reconfigure our relationships with each other and the planet and making the education paradigm wheel turn. So this requires deep unlearning of the deep-seated assumptions and dominant models of education we currently have. So there are different ways how we are trying to pedagogically engage with this, right? And actually, and I wanted to say that this project was supposed to be uh, only one year long project to coincide with the publication of the UNESCO's report in uh, 2021. But then what happened was that it became a project that took a life of its own and it's still ongoing. So the website is still live and anybody can still submit uh, their artwork and ideas and visions. And we constantly update the website with all of the new artwork that is coming in. So, but we do have some printed versions of the cards that you can see on the screen here. And uh, those are used in all kinds of com classrooms, con classroom conversations. They use as a uh, conversation starters in community um, meetings, but also in, pol in some of the um, policy making spaces like the UN. And we'll, Liz will talk about that a little bit more as well but the, the the artwork is so powerful as you can see that it really cannot be unseen right and what we are, are really hoping is that um it at the very least uh you know the these cards this project it can facilitate conversations in spaces where these conversations are much needed and um and it is perhaps a less um maybe threatening way to engage in these conversations, right? Because the, this artwork can be moving, can, can, it can be, um, but it is not really threatening, right? When you hold hold it in your hands or when you look at it. So it, it maybe helps to engage in the conversation in productive ways. But in addition to the cards, we also, I mentioned earlier, produced a policy report and we'll share the link to the policy report earlier. I mean, in the chat as well, but this was really fun to work on this as well, because we try to um, play, really push the boundaries with how we also do conventional report writing. So in this particular report, we uh, analyzed all of the artwork and all of the submissions and linked it with scientific uh, data and with the most recent literature um, on climate education but what we did was we um we also combined it with a lot of art and imagery and for example we had a we had an executive summary but also next to it we published the poetic summary where one of the students in the class um who was analyzed who was a part of the analysis data analysis team actually wrote perhaps even more powerful summary of the report compared to the executive summary, right? But this report also has, um, it's uh, meant for policymakers, but at the end of every section of the report, we also have exercises for policymakers where we make very concrete suggestions for them to pause and uh, step back and also think about what these, um, what these insights from youth visions um, have to do with them, right? So some of the exercises ask them to look through the deck of cards, to step outside and fight a climate activist and talk to a climate activist, or just sit in nature, right? And observe some of the things that are happening around them. So, and uh, and we were able to share this policy report with lots of uh, people, and Liz will talk about it a little bit more. Yeah, so where is this project going? Who is it going to? So as you can see on your screen, this was the initial launch of the project. This is where it got to go out into the world. And this was at COP26 in Glasgow back in 2021. And you can see the project just being shared with activists, with policymakers. You can see John Kerry up on the screen. So for those of you based in the US, that is 
our special um, envoy for climate, though I just got the New York Times notification that he might be stepping down. So a little update for everyone today. But this was the this was the launch. This was where it was meant to be shared. This was where we expected it to potentially end to inspire. But it continued to go and we continued to share the project in the policy report. So as you can see here, this was at the Un um, United Nations Transforming Education Pre-Summit in Paris at the UNESCO headquarters. And if you look to the bottom right and the top right of your screen, you can see the cards printed out on posters. And those were on the fences outside the UNESCO headquarters in Paris, just on display. So subtly incorporating the art, the messages of youth into these spaces, having them physically in the conference spaces, in the rooms, during sessions, where you're not necessarily directly, directly talking about the art, directly sharing the messages, but it's people are walking by, people are getting that subtle engagement, and it's getting in their minds the voices of youth. So then this is at the Transforming Education Summit in New York in 2022. You can see the project being shared with both the Vice Secretary General and Secretary General of the UN, and be, see it being shared with different ministers of education from around the world. And I think the key photo in this was in the bottom right, there is a panel of ministers of education at Columbia University and the artwork of the youth and their messages on these enlarged cards is there. And what's interesting about that to me, and I think to you all as well, is this is a conversation of adults about education who is the primary stakeholder of education? Youth. So youth were not in that room, but the people making decisions were. And the best way that we from our ends could incorporate the visions of youth into this space was bringing their art and the messages they've shared to us into it to be incorporated into that panel. And finally, most recently, back to what COP at COP28, John Kerry got another deck. I hope he's making a collection at this point, but we were able to share it with the secretary of the UNFCCC, the president of COP, and just have the cards on display, engage with activists, engage with policymakers, and continue to inspire people with the artwork and messages from youth around the world using this deck of cards and policy report. And we've also brought the project to a local level. So this has global implications as well as right at home in your own community. So in 2022, we organized a march at Arizona State University where students across the university marched to the president's office to demand for sustainability education across the university for all students. And we were able to meet with the president and ASU sustainability education program has expanded to the entirety of the university. Everyone has to learn at least a little bit of sustainability while they're there. So these efforts can be brought and applied and contextualized to your own local community as well. And you can see this in classrooms. So this was in partnership with Rob and Melanie Walton Sustainability Teachers Academies, as well as Stitch for Science, where a classroom inspired by the Turned Around project had their students create artwork about what they want to see for their climate futures. And that artwork was turned into a quilt for their classroom. So there's multiple creative projects and ways that the project can be interpreted to inspire people to think about what they want for the future, inspire youth to share their voices but in a creative way. So let me pull the link for you all very quickly, but if you are an educator or you work with educators, we do have resources for educators to use to incorporate the project into their classroom, as well as to share the ways that they've used the project and created curriculum, created activities so that other educators can use it as well. So the link I just dropped has all of those different projects, curriculum, activities, and we invite you to create your own and submit them. 